Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Adipec Virtual 2020, hosted by Adnoc. Please welcome to the stage Mr. John Defterios, Business Emerging Markets Editor, CNN International. And good afternoon from Abu Dhabi. It's a great pleasure to once again chair the Adipec opening session and appreciate the kind invitation from His Excellency Dr. Sultan al Jaber, the Group Chief Executive Officer of ADNOC and Minister of Industry and Advanced Technology, and His Excellency Suhail al Mazrui, the Minister of Energy and Infrastructure for the UAE. Like all of us here, we would have preferred to welcome you in the expanse of the Abu Dhabi National Exhibition Center, where we're all contending with, as our title underscores, unparalleled change. With a nod to my Greek ancestry, I quote the Greek philosopher Heraclitus, who rightly said, the only constant in life has changed. The words were echoed 500 BCE, but 2020 has taken that to a whole new level. COVID-19 has tested the oil and gas sector like never before from a 30% demand drop initially, and we're still looking at the sharpest annual decline in history of nearly 10% for the year. The second wave now underway, especially in Europe and the United States, will reinforce the need for agility, the right balance of cost cutting with the need to sustain investment and unearth value from your organizations where the potential exists, of course. It is in that spirit that we welcome to our virtual stage, Dr. Sultan al Jaber. Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it is with great pleasure that I welcome you to ADEPEC. And before I begin, allow me to take a brief moment to congratulate President-elect Joe Biden and Vice President-elect Kamala Harris on winning the U.S. election. Distinguished delegates, colleagues, partners, and friends, these are strange times. We are faced with new questions every day, and the answers feel harder to find than ever before. So I am specially pleased that so many of you have joined us in this virtual edition of ADEPEC. In fact, this platform has never been more needed because we are all facing the realities of a world turned inside out by the COVID-19 pandemic. We are, all of us, in this together. And together, we can come through it and emerge stronger. And yes, I mean that, much stronger. Times right now are hard, I know. And it sometimes feels like everything is drifting in uncertainty. But there are a few things we can hold on to that we know to be true. For a start, we know that the world will still need oil and gas when all of this is over with and done. Even at the height of the lockdowns of March and April, the world still consumed 75 million barrels of oil per day. In fact, by our estimates, oil demand fell below 90 million barrels of oil per day for only 12 weeks. So we know the world still needs oil and gas. That is a fact. We also know we have the people, the talent, and the capabilities to be resilient. And that means we know one more thing. We know that however hard things are right now, we will stand once more and stand stronger than before. The months ahead will be challenging and oil demand may fluctuate, but make no mistake, the long-term fundamentals of our industry remain intact. We expect that oil demand will grow to over 105 million barrels per day by 2030 and continue to supply over half the world's energy needs for many decades to come. At the same time, the petrochemical sector will continue to grow at a healthy pace through and beyond 2050 in line with a steadily expanding global middle class. These are long-term positive trends and they highlight the central role that our industry can and should play in a post-COVID recovery. So whatever the challenges we face today, we should remember that there is also opportunity. Opportunity to look once more at what we do, how we do it, and how we can do it better. How we can be more agile, lower cost, safer, 
Of course, each of us will have different opportunities depending on where we are and depending on our own individual circumstances. But let me give you an idea of where I see opportunity for ADROC. You all know of the transformation we started four years ago, driving down costs and unlocking value across our portfolio. Today, I see the opportunity to accelerate that progress. For example, take the way we have doubled down on embedding the latest digital technologies throughout our operations. We have saved over $1 billion in the last four years by leveraging big data through our Panorama Command Center. We have captured an additional $2 billion by adopting digital drilling. And together with the artificial intelligence leaders G42, we have formed AIQ, a company specially dedicated to develop AI solutions that will further enhance efficiencies for our industry. So there are opportunities to reduce costs. There are also opportunities to maximize value. In the case of ADNOC, we have been able to use the UAE and Abu Dhabi's status as a trusted, business-friendly environment to complete several landmark transactions. We inked a $20 billion pipeline deal and unlocked $5.5 billion in value from our real estate assets. These deals were struck in the most difficult year for the global economy in recent memory. And they prove the enduring and underlying value of our industry. So yes, our industry has brighter days ahead and there is even more value to be captured. At ADNOC, we are discovering this truth as we move into active trading. In September, we completed our first derivatives trade. Next month, we will begin trading the full portfolio of our refined products. And the first quarter of next year, we'll see the launch of ICE Futures Abu Dhabi or IFAD. IFAD will be the first exchange to include futures contracts based on Abu Dhabi's popular Marban grade. This trading platform will operate at the heart of growth markets and offer great value for producers and customers alike. Ladies and gentlemen, let me share another opportunity I see in these times. I have mentioned costs and talked about value. I also see the opportunity to expand. For ADNOC, that means expanding downstream. Our approach is to invest today to strengthen our position tomorrow by enhancing the UAE's industrial base. Our joint venture with the Abu Dhabi holding company, ADQ, is an essential piece to this puzzle. This JV is an investment vehicle for partners to join us in accelerating the development of our petrochemicals and derivatives industry here in Abu Dhabi. We have the oil and we have the natural gas. We have the infrastructure and we have the logistics. Everything you need and everything in one place and all in the perfect geographic location. Together with ADQ, I invite you to join us in this unique opportunity. Distinguished delegates, there is also one other opportunity I would like to talk about, and it is one that we all have a role to play in. We as an industry can do more on climate change. Yes, ADNOC is already one of the least carbon intensive producers in the world, but our aspirations are greater. So this is what ADNOC will do. In the next 10 years, we will reduce our greenhouse gas intensity by a further 25%. We are expanding our carbon capture program so that it stores 5 million tons of CO2 every single year. And importantly, we will explore the potential of new fuels such as hydrogen. And we will do all of this because there is one more thing we know for sure. We know that when the COVID pandemic fades into memory, the world will still need oil and gas. 
and will want that oil and gas to be as low carbon as possible. That is a market. That is an opportunity. So once more, I welcome you to ADEPEC. And yes, these are indeed strange times, but we are here together and there is opportunity. I look forward to exploring it with you and emerging stronger as a result. Thank you. Well, that was the sort of clarity we were looking for, an acknowledgement of the challenges and opportunities ahead in the next six to 12 months as vaccines become available not only in the developed world, but to the fast-growing emerging markets around the globe. Like the financial crisis a decade ago, the G20 under the chairmanship of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia is back at the center of a drive to ensure adequate stimulus is sustained in countries, but that there's a keen eye on those countries who offer growth in the future, but rightly need the funding here and now to get through these challenges. It is a vital agenda issue when the G20 convenes in two weeks' time. We have an excellent roundtable that is ready to come to the virtual stage, but we want first to take a look of what has unfolded during the first 11 months of the year through the lens of CNN coverage. Let's take a look back and what lies ahead in 2021. More than 2,800 people have died. The World Health Organization declares the coronavirus a pandemic now. States across the country are doing their part to try to flatten the curve. Restaurants, shops are largely closed. The virus is hitting some of the most vulnerable European economies and is undermining global equity markets as well. The pandemic has left global travel at a virtual standstill. WTI down, what, 30%? It's like from a different world. The largest savior and stimulus package the world's seen. EU leaders approved an unprecedented budget of over $2 trillion. It's a deal they had to do, otherwise the financial markets would have been shocked. Across the world, e-commerce has been a growth sector during the pandemic, presenting entrepreneurs with a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. The second wave of the coronavirus, more severe than the first. Concentrate on action to make the world more resilient. We are in a more shock-prone world. The IMF Managing Director projecting a contraction of 4.4% in 2020 and the road back to growth still uncertain linked to the distribution of vaccines. But the global response of better than $12 trillion of stimulus has buffered that downturn. Maintaining stimulus is a challenge, but one that needs to be met for the global economy and, of course, the energy market that we're talking about today. In my three decades of covering energy, many have miscalled the demise of OPEC many times. It has proven incorrect once again, especially in the new superstructure we now call OPEC+. Plus. It has defined its role as a stabilizer or global shock absorber. Who would have thought that negative oil pricing could exist even for 24 hours? A perfect storm hit the market in April during an unprecedented drop in demand. And the response was not, as we say in the United States, a little league approach. Nearly 10 million barrels a day to start, 7.7 .7 million now and cuts carrying forward to early 2022. We have four key players involved in that emergency response, and let's welcome them now. His Royal Highness Prince Abdulaziz bin Salman, Minister of Energy for the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. His Excellency Suhail <laughs> al-Mazuri, the Minister of Energy and Infrastructure in the UAE. His Excellency Mohammed Barkindo, the Secretary General of OPEC. And joining us, Pavel Sorokin, the Deputy Minister of Energy from the Russian Federation. I don't think we could have a better lineup. Gentlemen, welcome back to Adepec. I'd like to all see you face to face on the stage, but it's nice to have you virtually. Uh, I'm going to jump right in, if I may, here with His Royal Highness, uh, Prince Abdulaziz bin Salman. And, you know, we heard from Dr. Sultan about uh, what we've been through, uh, what has been done in response in terms of the stimulus and the OPEC Plus response. What's the key takeaway as we go into 2021, Your Highness? Uh, is it that we could have a spillover of a drop in demand that carries through the first half linked to vaccines? What are you prepared for in terms of the, the storm ahead or the optimism ahead? Please, Your Highness. 
Well, um, thank you very, very much for the introduction. Um, I would argue that OPEC had been, uh, has been, and continue to be a pro taking a proactive role. Uh, that's exactly what you have mentioned uh, with regard to the agreement. The agreement goes all the way beyond uh, 21 to uh, the end of uh, April, with a caveat that we could also decide to uh, uh, extend it for the rest of uh, 22. Uh, it certainly, uh, uh, the April agreement took into account what uh, may happen and proactively decided uh, to be prepared for the worst. And therefore, uh, we assume that uh, the agreement is uh, not only helping, it's actually, it has been an agreement that had that vision uh, in, uh, in its setting. Uh, we also, uh, as you may recall, uh, have been tweaking with it, uh, um, commensurate to what we have seen over the last few months. And we still have uh, the same tool in our kit and we can, uh, with the uh, consensus of everybody, we could uh, navigate with this agreement and tweak with this agreement subject to what we uh, may see in the future. We're also hopeful, like everybody in the whole world, uh, that uh, we uh, a solution uh, uh, to mitigate uh, the virus in the form of vaccine and the spread of vaccine uh, uh, availability would be the mean, most meaningful uh, type of mitigator to the situation. So we're still hopeful that uh, that vaccine is found, that vaccine or vaccines are spread, and hopefully uh, mobility will be regained and. Uh, a state of normality to the world economy would uh, transcend as, as a result of that. Uh, that's a lot of clarity, Prince Abdulaziz. It's interesting what you had to say here. You're saying you could tweak, and the, the kind of the multi-trillion dollar question, and I'll follow up with you, uh, Your Royal Highness, uh, are you willing to keep 7.7 .7 for a little bit longer in terms of the cuts if the requirement is there from OPEC plus if the recovery in the first half of 2021 is weak. Pre, uh, please, Prince Abdulaziz. John, you know me, uh, again, I, I don't uh, put policy uh, lines uh, uh, ahead of uh, reaching out to everybody, but I refer you to what we have done in the past. We did tweak. Uh, and I believe that with consultation with our friends, uh, some of them are present here and some of them are not, but I know wholeheartedly that they are committed to the principle of tweaking. Uh, I would go and argue it could be a tweak even even beyond what is the uh, uh, so-called analysts are talking about. But we are, the difference between us as OPEC Plus and uh, and. Uh, and the uh, juror is that uh, we're keeping our flexibility in, in our hands. And we are looking at the market. We see how these things evolve. Keep in mind, uh, I just give you an example, you know, with all the uh, uh, new uh, spread that is happening in Europe and commensurate uh, with that, uh, we have the welcome return of produ Libya's production. And yet, we are maintaining uh, the market in, in a sustainable, stable environment today. Uh, I don't think that anybody, lots of people are taking it, you know, giving it the right attention. But if it wasn't for this capability and capacity within OPEC Plus to be there physically present uh, with all the readiness to, to march and move, I don't think that we, uh, we could have had uh, this uh, situation prevailing today. Who could have said that with the return of Libya as about almost a million barrels today? And who could have said with the new emergence of uh, lockdowns, uh, which will impact mobility probably partially, but not like what we had in April. And yet we have uh, the, price, uh, the, uh, the stability of the market as, as it is today. So yes, we're ready. Great. We're, we're, you know, and I definitely would not predict, but certainly uh, some of those who are throwing predictions may get disappointed because 
uh, I think the choices we have are open choices. Okay, it's good. I can understand what you're suggesting, though, Your Royal Highness, about the flexibility. Let's bring in His Excellency Suhail al Mazrui, the Minister of Energy and Infrastructure uh, here in the UAE. Uh, I wanted to talk to you about this adherence to uh, the cuts. You know, if I rolled back the clock prior to the pandemic, it was primarily three or four producers that were in a sense, carrying the burden for the rest of the OPEC plus players, uh, partially because of the new leadership in Saudi Arabia. We're seeing much more discipline, much more response and much more compensation in terms of the dialogue here. Do we expect that to continue even with Libya coming back on the market? Uh, uh, Suhail al -Mazri. Thank you. Thank you, John. And uh, first, I would like to welcome His Royal Highness, uh, Prince Abdelaziz uh, uh, Pavel and uh, His Excellency Mohammed Parkindu virtually to Abu Dhabi. And we look forward to hosting you in person, hopefully next year. Um, I, think, uh, I think we have, we have demonstrated that this group as uh, OPEC Plus are uh, uh, First of all, they are up to the challenge of doing whatever it takes to, uh, to, to create that balance. I'm very proud of what has been achieved so far. Uh, and uh, we look forward to continuing this, this, uh, this journey. Of course, we have a deal in, uh, in front of us, and that deal has been working. And I agree with His Royal Highness, we have the ability to tweak if we have to tweak, but that will have to go to all of the countries and we have to be all convinced that that tweak is required. In terms of conformity levels, I think we have also demonstrated as a group that we've been uh, very disciplined and even those who were, who lagged behind in certain months have committed to uh, bring that uh, or, or cut that production or overproduction and adhere to 100% uh, in, in, uh, of, the, of the deal, including the United Arab Emirates. And you have seen that our production adjustment in, uh, in September have been uh, addressing the, uh, the overproduction that we had to, uh, to do. And we are continuing that in October as well, and you'll see the numbers. So I think I think we are all uh, uh, committed uh, partners, and it's a fair deal, which is the uh, the compensation. And I think the uh, the fact that we have worked together so long as OPEC Plus will uh, will uh, give you the conclusion that this group will continue to cooperate and work together in the uh, longer, uh, medium and long term uh, cooperations. Minister uh, Mazuri, thank you very much. Let's bring in the Secretary General of OPEC, uh, His Excellency uh, Mohammed Barkindo. Is there a danger that we get lulled in thinking that the second wave, Your Excellency, of the pandemic can be met with a similar firepower of stimulus? Because that $12 trillion plus has been a strain on the coffers of most economies around the world, about 20 percent of GDP in terms of debt levels going up. And we could sleepwalk into quite a crisis, not only for the energy market, but for the global economy. And what do you need to do to prepare for that second wave uh, into the first half of 2021? Please. Uh, thank you very much, John. And uh, let me begin by congratulating the UAE, in particular the twin brothers of Suhail al-Mazrui and Sultan al-Jabr uh, for making a very a strong and bold statement of optimism by keeping faith uh, despite the extraordinary events of this year and continuing to host this very important forum. And as Sultan has just mentioned, there is no better time than now uh, to convene at this forum and take stock of this extraordinary events of 2020 and hopefully project uh, the recovery in the months and years to come. Now, your question on this stimulus package, um, our numbers here in Vienna uh, show that uh, to date, including the guarantees, 
we have cumulatively on global scale uh, uh, stimulus packages in the region of nearly 25 trillion US dollars, about 20% of the global GDP. Now, that tells you uh, the gravity of the slump and the contraction on the global economy, on energy, demand for oil, uh, and not to talk of the human sufferings that we have seen uh, this year. Now, we look at it from the prism of optimism, that it shows that the global economy and world leaders are more than capable and have shown their extraordinary commitment to rescue the global economy, including energy and oil, by rising to the challenge. Now, going forward, yes, there is concern from the banking community of debt crisis. But I think the recovery uh, in the months and years to come will more than compensate uh, for this risk to the downside. According to our own estimates, we see contraction in the global economy in the region of about 4.4, minus 4.4 percent this year. But there is a rebound in 2021, 4.7 percent and still being revised upwards. Same for the demand. Yes, we have seen or we are seeing contraction of nearly 9.8 million barrels a day for 2020. But the 2021 forecasts are continuously being revised upwards, north of 6.5 million barrels a day at the moment. And you have seen the reaction of the market after the US elections. So there is no cause for alarm. I think that uh, global leaders, including the G20, uh, chaired by the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia this year, and the leadership of the OPEC, non-OPEC declaration of cooperation, have all risen to this challenge. And we have shown our commitment to stay the course. The compliance levels from month of May to date are averaging about 100% and beyond. This has never happened in the history of OPEC since the declaration of cooperation was signed in December of 2016. And you can see the commitments from the biggest producers, uh, even on this panel, uh, to continue to demonstrate this extraordinary response to these extraordinary events. Great. Thank you very much, Secretary General. Let's bring in uh, Pavel Sorokin, who's the Deputy uh, Minister of Energy and a familiar face when we uh, go to the OPEC Plus uh, gatherings. Uh, I think, uh, Minister Sorokin, I'd love to get your thoughts on when do we get back up to 100 million barrels a day of global demand, or have we already seen peak demand? What is the Russian Federation's view on when we can get back to where we were before the pandemic, or is that c'est la vie? We've reached peak demand already. Well, first of all, uh, I would like to greet uh, His Royal Highness, Excellencies John, and I would like to also say thank you to the Emirates for organizing uh, a very well-organized event in these difficult times of the pandemic. And uh, moving on to your question, I think that's a rather good one and a very important one for understanding how investment trends and how basically the oil market trends would unfold. I mean, obviously, we the pandemic would have a significant impact on uh, behavioral patterns of all consumers and primarily in uh, air travel. Uh, we've seen significant uh, significant progress in uh, distance learning, in distance working, you know, and remote access to things. And of course, that's not something which would be forgotten overnight after we defeat the pandemic and the virus. Uh, so this means that there will be changes and demand growth will be slower. So I don't uh, think that uh, we're going to see a full recovery in the next two years of air travel, although although it has to be stated that uh, there will be more personal transport use 
and the middle class after the after basically we're past the pandemic and after the stimuli measures start working and having an impact and it has already been said that we have seen unprecedented inflows of uh, finance into the global economy to help fight uh, the economic effect and i think uh, there will there will be more so more measures are being discussed so basically this would have a positive impact uh, on overall cash uh, at the disposal of the population and hopefully we do start seeing some prompt economic recovery so there will be more driving there will be more uh, demand for energy sources so i think it's too early to say that uh, that basically we are past peak demand i think we're far from it and uh, in all our forecasts and in all our analysis we see demand continuing to grow for the next 10 15 years at least uh, and after that you know we would be we would be around plateau uh, but I think it's once again too early to say that uh, the era of oil is over. At the same time, I think it could take about maybe two years uh, to come, two, three years to come back to 100 million barrels per day or close to that level. Uh, but once again, you know, considering the fact that uh, there is very positive cooperation from the OPEC plus group and very responsible behavior from all members. Um, and also we are seeing uh, a market based supply response from all other countries uh, it means that basically the supply levels are also adequate to answer to that challenge so it's a crisis it's definitely something which um, has had a huge impact on the energy market and has sparked a new wave of interest towards renewable sources uh, partially as part of the stimuli package uh, in a similar fashion to what we saw after the Great Depression and what we saw at different stages in history when roads were being built and that's just basically infrastructure for the future. Uh, but at the same time, but at the same time, hydrocarbons, they still offer the most competitive source of energy. And if we are going to talk about recovery in the global economy, then it's not something which can be achieved without a competitive source. Uh, we do have to answer all the global trends about being clean and green and um, and reducing the carbon footprints through various measures, including carbon capture and storage, including um, including basically planting trees. But uh, once again, at the same time, even with all these measures, hydrocarbons still remain the backbone of the global energy of the global energy scene, and uh, it's not it's not something the world can do without. Okay, me a quick follow-up to you, uh, uh, Deputy Minister Sorokin. Uh, if you looked at next era in the United States, which is a renewable power generator, as you know, uh, it surpassed the market cap of ExxonMobil. And everybody said, like Tesla when it had that market cap, oh, it's a flash in the pan and GM and Ford will come back up to the market cap of Tesla. What is Wall Street telling us? What are global markets telling us about the energy transition? I'm worried that those in the oil and gas sector may be sleepwalking to a crisis. Uh, isn't this trend well underway? It's a transition, could be 20, could be 50 years, but isn't it well underway in terms of the financing behind it? Uh, Deputy Minister Sorokin, then I come back to His Excellency uh, Prince Abdulaziz. It's, it's a very good question. I mean, I think, uh, I think Wall Street is telling us that we've had 12 years of quantitative easing and a lot of money at a very low rate, and that money is pouring into the market at a very fast pace. Uh, when basically you can see from other metrics that, uh, that a big chunk of that a big chunk of that money has gone into inflating valuations, and of course money goes where uh, where the trends are. Uh, what it's also telling us is that uh, with a 25 to 30 percent drop in capex uh, in traditional energy, i.e. in oil and gas, uh, and significant decline rates in most of the projects which have been driving the surge in supply of the past years and uh, many countries putting expensive projects on hold it's telling us that if we when we do see demand recovery uh there is a chance of a supply crunch and that's not good for it's, it's not good for the suppliers it's not good for the consumers which basically means that we all have to be sensible and understand that no matter how how basically popular uh, new trends are and how much money flows into them and how what valuations are, we still have to care about living today, tomorrow, and in five years uh, when these new energy sources would not be able to replace hydrocarbons. That's why we have to be responsible and ensure that there is enough investment into hydrocarbons, which basically means that the price has to uh, ensure that uh, there is enough reinvestment potential and there is enough reinvestment interest in those sectors. So I would say that uh, Wall Street, it's, it's, it's a flow of money. It's definitely an indicator of the future. But uh, that's 
basically what the responsible producers are there for, uh, to ensure that consumers do get their cheap energy, well, I would say affordable energy, uh, no matter what the what Wall Street valuations show. And um, if returns are not high enough in the oil and gas sector for the next 10, 15 years, when demand is still growing, that just means less investment and a higher price. And uh, we have to make sure we have to make sure, basically, as I said, that uh, uh, there is enough uh, investment in the oil sector to ensure global needs. So Wall Street is a good indicator, but uh, there is also responsibility of producers. Great. Thank you very much. It's great analysis from this uh, superb panel. I'm not too surprised. I'd like to bring in His Royal Highness uh, Prince Abdulaziz uh, once again. Um, and, and a political question, if you will, because I'm trying to search around the big elephant in the room here, uh, the influence of uh, former Vice President Joe Biden becoming president of the United States and what influence it will have on the energy market. Uh, as you know, and I've covered this, uh, he's earmarked $2 trillion to green investments, green infrastructure, uh, going into renewable uh, power in terms of solar and wind in the United States. He's not going to kill off shale. We've heard that from him. But what do you think is the number one impact, do you think, Your Royal Highness, uh, on the Biden presidency and when it comes to energy? Well, uh, first of all, uh, I would like to uh, uh, congratulate the new administration uh, for winning that election. Uh, but regardless of uh, w what happens, I think we have uh, quite a history with the U.S. Uh, of almost 80 years, if not more, of dealing with each other. Uh, we are going through the same transformative uh, mode as Saudi Arabia. We are converting our power sector to more towards uh, renewable and gas. Uh, we are uh, seeking the same uh, quest, which is being more efficient producer of energy, uh, making sure that uh, we are also efficient in terms of our investments. I think the whole quest of being efficient energy uh, uh, producer and energy consumer is, uh, is a global quest. Uh, so anything that improve efficiencies in terms of production, in terms of uh, uh, handling or even uh, consumption, and also in terms of developing a more sustainable energy system, global energy system, is a quest that we are all are aspiring uh, to achieve. And I believe that each and every country has its own responsibility of attending to that quest. I also believe that uh, uh, to do that, we have to develop lots of technologies. And we should be indifferent on which of the fuels that we use so long as we achieve our uh, KPIs of, of uh, ensuring that the world is well supplied with energy and the world also uh, consuming this and producing it and consuming it in a very efficient way. And also we are uh, doing it well, well set, uh, we are achieving our sustainable development objectives and certainly uh, making sure that uh, uh, all of these greenhouse gases at all sectors are being mitigated or handled in in a way that will make us uh, uh, get to get away with the so-called win-win situation, uh, powering and energizing the world economy. Yet we're doing it in a sustainable way. That's why uh, a lot of people see eye to eye with us with regard to the circular carbon economy as a concept, which is going to be the congregator of many efforts uh, and uh, the CCE would would come with a with a big tag in terms of uh, uh, international collaboration challenging technologies that needs to be produced so it is a welcomed uh, uh, new uh, approach to the US but uh, it, it, it certainly uh, as a producer of uh, hydrocarbon, uh, we'll look at uh, CCE, and we have been working with them on, on many things, including uh, car carbon sequesterization. That is a program that has started with uh, uh, three or four different uh, administrations, and there is a lot of commonalities on what the new administration will be doing and what we are actually physically doing in Saudi Arabia. Good. Let me follow up, if I may, with you, because you talked about the 80-year-plus alliance between the United States and Saudi Arabia. 
Uh, Joe Biden's not a person of knee-jerk reaction, so he's going to lay out $2 trillion for renewables. He said he wouldn't kill off shale. Uh, he knows the Middle East politics here. Do you see him rushing in to reestablish the nuclear agreement with Iran and then allow Iran in oil onto the market? Or do you think it'll be a gradual approach, Your Royal Highness? Uh, or do you want to lend the position of Saudi Arabia during this ADAPEC conference? Well, well uh, the, the nuclear issue is more of a political, strategical issue. I, I think it's certainly not within my domain. I, I honestly be also know that there is a, an institutional uh, uh, legislative arrangement that needs to be uh, seen, and therefore uh, I would be one of the spectators as opposed to uh, commenters on this issue. We will handle whatever may happen uh, uh, within OPEC+, Plus. likewise we did with, uh, with Libya, likewise we did with Iran in the uh, previous situation. And there were so many other countries uh, that went through different uh, scenarios and different situations where their production was uh, severely curtailed for all sorts of reasons. And historically, OPEC alone and OPEC plus did manage to handle these uh, reversals as, as they come, both at both ends, when, when there is uh, production declines including industrial industrial caused production declines, we have been able to manage. Again, uh, it is a safe bet uh, to, to bet on the resilience of OPEC plus. Uh, with regard to the two trillion or whatever the number may be, again, uh, keep in mind that it will be, if it comes, and uh, I hope it does, uh, that it will be uh, uh, spent on power sector. Well, that's uh, a commendable uh, endeavor because actually there is no uh, uh, oil is being used in the U.S. in almost none w when it comes to uh, the power sector. So changing uh, the use of coal uh, and converting it uh, to using renewable is actually a commendable way of attending to climate change issues and uh, lending a great deal of support to the mitigation endeavor, including the reduction of the greenhouse gases. It is something that the world would lo be looking forward for, because as you may know, John, uh, the US and China are the biggest emitters, and therefore novel and creative solutions as this uh, are commendable, especially that it would impact more or less coal in the first place. Great. Thank you very much for the analysis and uh, jumping into that fray and taking a, a very uh, sober view of what's ahead here with uh, a moderate uh, assessment of uh, Joseph Biden. So, Hal al Mizrui, the Minister of uh, Energy for the UAE and Infrastructure as well, uh, what's your assessment of what it means for global growth and therefore demand from the United States for energy and demand from China on the recovery under a Biden presidency? We had a high wire act with trade tensions between the U.S. and China. Does that clear away with the multilateral approach of Joe Biden? How do you how do you assess it early days here? I think, John, <clears throat> it's definitely someone would hope that uh, any ease in the uh, in the tension between uh, the United States and China in, in regards to the to the to the trade would promote more demand uh, and would promote uh, growth, uh, further growth in China. If that would happen, I think that would be good news to uh, to the uh, to the first of all recovery of demand and then hopefully growth in the years to come. So I'm I'm a bit more uh, optimistic in that front, and I hope that uh, that uh, that would happen and that would lead to more uh, prosperity when it comes to the international trade. Uh, and uh, and I think I think the uh, the other angle that you have to look at is uh, is the uh, U.S. back to the Paris Agreement and what does that mean in terms of a commitment. But I think if you are looking at a short term rather than uh, than a long term, I don't think a huge impact will be in the short term of of the U.S. coming back to the uh, to the Paris Agreement. So 
all in all, I'm, uh, I'm more optimistic on, uh, on the positives that, rather than the negatives of, the, uh, of what could happen. Great. Let me bring in His Excellency, the Secretary General of OPEC, on this very topic. And we've talked about this in the past when I was at uh, the OPEC meetings in Vienna. You would get pretty aggressive tweets from Donald Trump saying not to cut too much and then to release the oil and it was a very combative relationship. At the end of the day, there was actually a partnership that emerged between President Trump and the OPEC plus apparatus and a willingness to come to the rescue for the global economy during the worst of the pandemic. Will OPEC, in a sense, uh, Secretary General, miss Donald Trump? And how does it change under Joe Biden? Uh, what a question. Um, way back uh, in 2016, uh, when we crafted the Declaration of Cooperation, uh, it was the considered opinion of both the OPEC and the non-OPEC ministers that uh, this alliance was incomplete without the United States for obvious reasons, and therefore mandated the Secretariat to reach out uh, to the U.S. industry and institutions, which we did. Uh, we broke ice and uh, we got on with the dialogue that has continued till today. And this energy dialogue uh, was uh, uh, in the best interest, not only for OPEC or the, uh, what is referred to as OPEC plus, but also for the consuming countries and the US in particular. Uh, we look forward to continuing uh, this dialogue in the months and years to come, because the US has a special place on the table in the global energy transition. And this global conversation would be incomplete, as we both found out in the last four years, without the US taking its uh, rightful position uh, in, uh, in, 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 this, in, this, in these discussions. OK, good. And the other thing I was going to ask you about, you've had the shale producers as part of the dialogue. Let's get the comments from um, His Excellency Pavel Sorokin here. What's the Russian view of we've had 500 uh, midstream to large producers in the shale basins go bankrupt over the last five years, nearly $300 billion of debt. And I was just compiling the numbers over the last two weeks. Is this the new reality that you can't produce oil for just the sake of getting high production, and this is a shakeout, and the most efficient producers, Russia, Saudi Arabia, UAE, those that are around the table, are the ones that survive, and this is the realities of a post-pandemic world? Well, thanks a lot for the question. It's another very important one, I guess, and uh, I cannot ignore the, I cannot uh, ignore the fact that so I've already mentioned the fact that we've been living for 12 years in an era of almost free money, and uh, I have to come back to that factor again. So the phenomena of the shale revolution, besides the technological breakthrough, which of course uh, was remarkable, but at the same time it was made possible, just like the inflated valuations and valuations in many of the financial assets, which we discussed in the previous uh, question. Uh, but basically the phenomena was made possible by the abundance of funding. When you didn't have to be free cash flow positive for years, you know, and it well, pretty much lasted a decade, uh, and you could be funding operations just by promises of higher and higher production, uh, because pretty much there was not too much, uh, there, were, there were not too many places where investment could go. So that's something which also fueled a lot of inefficient drilling and a lot of inefficient investment uh, globally. I mean, this is this uh, this is not just related to shale. Uh, but and, and not just related to oil and gas. I mean, in many sectors, we're seeing this. Uh, so basically now it just means that um, people would have to be more focused and more, I would say, returns driven. We've actually seen this trend over the past two years when prices started to slowly come down. You know, so we, we, we first of all, we had the period of 2014, 2016, uh, when the industry, uh, when the costs have been significantly reduced and the industry became significantly more efficient. But after 2016, 2017, when prices recovered and the market recovered, we once again saw significant cost inflation in the oil field service industry globally. We never came back to the pre-2014 levels or pre-2008 levels in some cases, but nevertheless, there was a lot of inflation. Uh, and uh, a lot of, well, a, a lot less capex discipline at the same time. But in 2019 and at the end of 2018, we already started to see investors putting dividends in focus and returns in focus. So that did uh, see some 
uh, reduction in the pace of growth and in the pace of uh, capex increase in the shale industry. What is happening now is that the industry is pretty much uh, cleansing itself of some of the debts or restructuring it, and uh, we are seeing consolidation. So I wouldn't say that um, the numbers you've mentioned uh, that they're critical. Uh, because bankruptcy pretty much means, once again, restructuring of debt and the change uh, of ownership of the asset in many cases, uh, which just means that uh, the inefficient assets would be temporarily put on hold until prices allowed to develop them. And uh, the more efficient assets would be uh, would have a significantly smaller debt load on them after restructuring. So it it, it's in a way, it's in a way, once again, a path to more efficiency. But at the same time, I believe that investors would be now more, much more cautious, and they would still be putting returns first. So at around current price levels, you know, plus minus, uh, it would be very difficult to see a significant increase in production on uh, high co in high cost basins or in high cost areas, because well, people want returns. They understand that we are in an era of volatility when uh, price fluctuations, significant price fluctuations can happen, and uh, that would have an impact on what they earn from their investment. So uh, this, uh, this is a factor which everybody would have to live with. And so the countries with cheaper reserve bases, which you've mentioned, uh, three of them are present here at the table, I think with some of the best-in-class best class assets and best-in-class expertise, um, to develop it, of course, uh, these countries would uh, have more flexibility and uh, they would have, uh, once again, the responsibility uh, to behave responsibly because everybody has spare capacity. Everybody around this table has a lot of spare capacity. Uh, but the question is, you know, do you throw that out at the market or um, behave responsibly? And I think for everybody's benefit uh, to, uh, to minimize these price fluctuations and volatility, um, everybody has chosen the path uh, which, which, which you see now in the market. So... We uh, in Russia, uh, we are also taking measures. I mean, obviously, we have a slightly different reserve structure and a slightly different um, domestic market structure, uh, more companies working and uh, significantly a higher well fund. So, I mean, it's a bit more difficult to produce in Russia. But at the same time, we're taking all measures possible to also remain competitive in the market and to reduce costs. One of the things mentioned um, at, uh, at the beginning by His Excellency, the CEO of ADNOC, uh, was the digitalization of, um, of all processes. And that is one of the key tasks of the Ministry of Energy now, to actually ensure that companies have all the instruments and all the regulatory framework in place to be able to use uh, modern technology and modern digital technologies. Uh, to reduce costs, and we we'll definitely have all the means to do that. Uh, so that would help us. Uh, that will help us reduce costs and um, further improve the competitiveness of the resource base, uh, just like our colleagues uh, sitting around the table. Um, so okay. yeah. Uh, maybe, let me jump in, Deputy Minister, and I need a 15-second answer from you, and then I'm going to get the Secretary General and circle back to His Royal Highness. Uh, there's a change in government uh, cabinet in Russia today. Uh, the person that we know around the table very close to the other partners that you're sitting with today, Alexander Novak, uh, promoted to deputy prime minister. Would it change whatsoever the strategy and commitment to OPEC plus uh, from the viewpoint of President Putin? Is there any indication that a change of minister would lead to any change in dialogue with OPEC plus? Well, I mean, we let's let's uh, wait and see for uh, for all the appointments and all the proposals to actually be enforced, because I think it's too early to talk about uh, these things now, because it's uh, it's the government which assigns responsibilities to deputy prime ministers, and first the deputy prime minister has to be approved by the state Duma. So I suggest that we uh, wait for all these things uh, to actually be official. Uh, and comment on that afterwards. But in any case, as I've mentioned uh, today, uh, Russia is a responsible player on the energy market, and that's something which uh, governs our decisions and uh, our thinking. Okay, very good. Secretary General, you wanted to say a word about Alexander Novak. We have to be careful of time here, uh, but he's been strategically important in the co-chairmanship with Saudi Arabia and the presidency in the year before with uh, the other gentleman around the table, uh, Suhail al -Mizbrui. Uh, it's vital to keep the Russians together in this OPEC plus. What's the message? Well, uh, taking note of um, the advice of uh, uh, Pavel Sorokin uh, on this process that is just unfolding, all what can what one can say at the moment is that uh, 
uh, Alexander Novak uh, has been what I have always called uh, the reliable and the dependable uh, bridge between the OPEC and non-OPEC and uh, the umbilical cord, if you like, of the declaration of cooperation. He had uh, played a leadership role uh, since uh, the beginning of this process in 2015 uh, and during uh, the meetings in uh, Algiers uh, that led to the Algiers Accord in September of 2016 and the Vienna Agreement on November the 30th on 2016, as well as the Declaration of Cooperation itself uh, on the 10th of December uh, 2016. And since then till now, uh, he has uh, uh, continued uh, uh, showing that commitment, that leadership, a team player. He had played with all his colleagues uh, both in OPEC and the non-OPEC and earned the respect uh, of all of us. Uh, we remain proud uh, of him. Uh, he is a tested and proven a leader uh, in all uh, meaning of the word. And we are confident that his uh, career uh, prospects uh, uh, will remain like a shining uh, star. Okay, I'm going to ask for a minute each from his, uh, our host, Minister Suhail al Mizmoui, and uh, His Royal Highness Prince Abdulaziz to finish off. If I'm listening to all of you carefully, and we have that underinvestment uh, in shale now, and that correction that's probably a healthy correction because of where we got to in the last three or four years, and the IOC is being much more selective about where they're willing to put money into oil and gas because of the transition and pressure from shareholders, doesn't this play to the strength? of the low-cost producers, particularly here in the Gulf and in Russia, and we could see a snapback in prices once the pandemic's over. Uh, Suhail Azmuzri and his uh, Prince Abdulaziz, you can pick up off of the, uh, the minister of uh, the UAE, and we'll wrap the session. Please, uh, Minister Mazuri. Well, uh, I, think, I think we are more worried now as a group with the collaboration, with the... Uh, with the uh, uh, the countries who are also relying on us to supply them. So the relationship between suppliers and producers have been evolved. We always listen to them. So I don't think it's, it's a matter of a price anymore. It's a matter of balance. It's a matter of investing to ensure that we have the capacity whenever it needs it needed for the future. So I think I think that relationship uh, has been very well developed. And I don't think any of us now is just looking at increasing the prices uh, only. We are looking at a fair and a sustainable uh, commodity production in the future. Okay. Yeah, Your Royal Highness, you actually uh, recently almost sounded like Clint Eastwood uh, kind of saying to traders, don't make my day. What are you thinking about that here in the context of the IOCs and their underinvestment in oil and gas? What's your forecast here once we get past the pandemic? I'm not talking about prices, but this ability uh, of underinvestment hitting the price higher. But I, I have a history with that since uh, I've been involved in this. You know, you would if you live, go and check check out. I've, I've said a lot of things about that issue in the 90s, uh, where I was warning people uh, that low investments uh, carry the seeds for higher. Uh, prices and low oil prices carry the seeds for higher prices, and, and the reverse uh, does happen too. Uh, my concern now, uh, um, you know, not a lot of people are focusing on on the issue of what it takes to maintain potential. You know, lots of people do not um, either they ignore or are not willing to see how much money. Each, each and every oil company, be it international company or IOC or NOC, the amount of money that is spent on investment just to maintain potential is a lot, uh, let alone uh, even reaching out to their other objectives, be it downstream, midstream, or diversifying their portfolio and what have you. If if this situation today prevails and the price and the market situation prevail. The more uh, preparing today, the more it, it to be extended. I believe uh, strongly that we will wake up one day 
with an evolving uh, growth uh, in the world economy, but uh, with not enough substantial amount of uh, capacity to uh, attend to that. And we have to say it also, uh, not only in terms of upstream investment, I would argue that uh, you will have a bottleneck on the midstream, you will have a bottleneck on downstream. It's exactly what happened uh, during the 90s. The reason we had higher oil prices uh, in the beginning of 20 and some and what have you until 15 was uh, it has to do with the lack of investment. And if you look back, you would see it was lack of investment on upstream, midstream, and downstream. So I worry a lot uh, that uh, if, as was Pavel was saying in his first uh, early remarks, that uh, this situation would be carried forward with us until the beginning of 23. Uh, we had lost 21, 20, which means we will lose 21 and 22. Uh, with that, and if you look at the capital uh, spending that could have happened in 20, 21, and 23, 22, I would love to see how the world will uh, re relate to oil prices and energy prices in general with a uh, low investment and and the impact that it would, you know, lots of heroes will be lost, lots of contractors will be lost, lots of uh, engineering from, from companies will be lost. Lots of manufacturers will be lost. There are lots of people that had been under the tire over the last year, this year, will be under the tire next year. Uh, and that's why I believe that uh, the whole ecosystem, the whole energy uh, ecosystem, and along with the world economy, will be best served if the world economy need the energizer and the efficient energizer and the uh, moderately costed energy, uh, mitigating the virus and finding the the vaccine and spreading the vaccine would be our should be our utmost everybody's in this world utmost uh, hope and purpose. We've heard that through the G20 chairmanship of the kingdom at the same time. I appreciate that. Uh, fantastic panel, as always. I'm not surprised whatsoever. Uh, Pavel Sorokin st stepping in for Alexander Novak today as Deputy Minister of Energy and the Russian Federation. Thanks very much. Uh, always a pleasure. Mohammed uh, Sunuzi Al Barkindo, the Secretary General uh, of uh, OPEC. Uh, our host minister, Suhail Al Mazrui, the Minister of Energy and Infrastructure, and His Royal Highness, Prince Abdulaziz uh, bin Salman bin Abdulaziz Al Saud. Uh, joining us uh, from Riyadh today. Gentlemen, it's always a pleasure. Thanks very much for your time and your succinct answers. Thank you. Uh, we'll be back in uh, just over an Thank hour. Uh, we'll have the first strategic dialogues taking place uh, with three distinguished CEOs, the CEOs of Total, uh, BP, and CNPC of China. That's going to take place at 1600 here in the UAE uh, or 1200 GMT. So we look forward to participation there in the same discussion that we just had on investment. Uh, stand by here. It's a, a very important window. We're doing it virtually. It'll be the Adapac Awards for 2020. Thanks for watching. We live in extraordinary times. Humanity has been shaken at its core. Unprecedented events have propelled the global economy and with it, the energy industry into uncharted territory. We have seen challenges compound, emotions surge and unimaginable events take place. But we pulled together to weather this storm. And now we must embrace this volatility as an opportunity to grow, to rebuild smarter and stronger than ever before. These times are catalysts for change. Never before has it been more crucial to harness our energy and share it with the world. And never before has it been more relevant to celebrate our achievements. Today, in our 10th anniversary, we celebrate resilience, agility and adaptability. We celebrate innovation, creativity and collaboration. We celebrate change and the opportunities that lie ahead. We celebrate the extraordinary, the pathfinders and the pioneers. Today, we celebrate you. Welcome to the Edivic Awards 2020.
please join me in welcoming to the stage Mr. Ahmed Al Qasimi, your host for today. Your Highnesses, Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 2020 Virtual Adepec Awards. I'm delighted to welcome so many of you here on this virtual platform to celebrate and recognize together our industry's best in class. Those who have contributed to the advancement of the global energy community and have inspired new ways of thinking. The organizations, projects, and individuals we celebrate today are pioneers, breaking down barriers and driving positive change in the industry. Especially in this unprecedented year, it's more important than ever that we identify and honor their achievements. Today is the landmark 10th edition of the Adepec Awards, marking a full decade of celebrating excellence in energy. The award winners announced today will inspire our global community and drive the leadership necessary to navigate together the next chapter of our industry. Your Highnesses, Excellencies, Distinguished Guests, we've taken the opportunity of our 10th year anniversary to implement a number of significant changes aimed at expanding the award's already substantial reach, impact, and legacy. 2020 marks the launch of four new categories, solutions to climate change, lifetime achievement, oil and gas startup, and operational excellence. These categories extend the scope of the awards and enhance their relevance with our continuously evolving and adapting industry. We have put in place a more refined adjudication process consisting of three tiers of evaluation. From a technical committee of 46, through to a selection committee of 19, and final awarding by our esteemed jury. This thorough process is aimed at ensuring extreme transparency while assessing a large and complex number of applications. Our efforts have resulted in an increased geographical distribution of submissions, with 2020 marking the first year where the awards has received over 50% of submissions from Europe and Asia. Without further ado, Please join me in welcoming Mrs. Fatma Naimi, CEO of Adnoc LNG and Chairperson of the Adepec Awards. Your Highnesses, Your Excellencies, esteemed jury members, inspiring finalists, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Adepec Awards from wherever in the world you are joining us. I'm so pleased and excited to have the honor of introducing to you the 10th Annual Adepic Awards. 2020 has certainly brought unprecedented challenges that we could not have imagined a year ago. But what has really struck me is how the qualities that we have had to exhibit in response to the pandemic are actually exactly the same as the ones we need to make our business fit for the future. Namely, collaboration, innovation, and sustainability. So this year has just made us value even more those colleagues who bring these special qualities. What makes the Adabic Awards more relevant and important than ever is that they give us the opportunity to celebrate and thank some of those who are showing the kind of leadership we require in our industry, especially at this time. And before I go any further, let me express my heartfelt thanks to my fellow jurists and the selection and technical committee members who constantly demonstrate all of these qualities and more in carrying out the difficult task of carefully reviewing submissions and choosing winners from a truly incredible set of nominees. At this juncture, allow me to take a moment to pay a personal tribute to one of our longest serving jury members, Hatem Nasiba, the former country chair of Total in the UAE. Who, who passed away recently. He was a pillar of Adibic and of our wider community in the oil and gas industry. He was much loved 
and is greatly missed. In this, the 10th year of the Adabic Awards, the important values of collaboration, innovation, and sustainability have been reflected in new ways. First, and in keeping with the spirit of collaboration, this year, we have seen the greatest international reach for the awards, with nominees coming from more countries than ever before. Next, in recognition of the importance of protecting our wonderful planet for our grandchildren and for generations to come, we have introduced a new award focused on energy solutions to climate change. And finally, to encourage innovation, we are for the first time highlighting the best in oil and gas startups. I'm so excited to share with you some of the achievements of the incredible professionals in our industry. Better yet, we know this is just the tip of the iceberg, as there are truly impressive developments taking place right across our industry today. Let us all take forward this recently refound passion and spirit and ensure that our industry continues to serve society in the best way possible, not just today, but for many years to come. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, and my sincere congratulations to every award winner. Thank you, Fatma, for your leadership and heartfelt words. This year's Adepec Awards is the first judged by our all-new stellar panel. These exceptional judges have magnified the value, prestige, and visibility of the Adepec Awards in 2020, and we are grateful for their contribution. Please allow me to introduce them. His Excellency Suhail al Mazrui, Minister, Energy and Infrastructure, United Arab Emirates. His Excellency Tarek al Mulla, Minister, Petroleum and Mineral Resources, Arab Republic of Egypt. Dr. Fatih Birol, Executive Director, International Energy Agency. Vicky Holub, President and CEO, Occidental. Lorenzo Simonelli, Chairman, President and CEO, Baker Hughes. Takeyuki Ueda, President and CEO, Inpex Corporation, Dr. Pratima Rangarajan, CEO, OGCI Climate Investments, Jason Bordoff, Founding Director, Center on Global Energy Policy, Columbia University, Fatima Al Nuemi, Chairperson, Adipec Awards, CEO, Adnoc LNG. The Adipec Awards 2020 Jury. Not only did our judges invest time in selecting the winners, but some of them are here with us today, ready to share their thoughts. Please allow me to introduce His Excellency Sahil Mohammed Al Mazrouri, His Excellency Tariq Al Mulla, Mr. Lorenzo Simonelli, Mrs. Vicky Holib, Mr. Takayuki Ueda, and Dr. Pratima Rangarajan. Welcome and thank you for joining us today. Please allow me to start with His Excellency Sahil Mazrouri. Your Excellency, how would you describe your first experience with judging the awards? Thank you, thank you, Ahmed, and it's great uh, to uh, to see uh, all of you, uh, your Excellencies, and good friends uh, virtually. It uh, I was honored, first of all, to participate with this uh, distinctive uh, jury committee to uh, look at those impressive and great. Uh, Submissions. I was uh, I was surprised with the diversity, the uh, the intellectual uh, uh, and uh, and innovative uh, efforts put into the submissions, and the uh, the countries that and the, the the countries and the companies that they they came from. So. To me, that was very uh, assuring that this industry is well taken care of. 
by those uh, individuals and companies who are continuing to to innovate and focus on collaboration, focus on sustainability, even though we they are producing uh, hydrocarbon and reduce and working together in, in reducing the carbon footprint. So uh, it was a great experience. And uh, I, uh, I personally uh, was reading even those who were, I mean, I was, I was interested to read all of the submissions that I have seen. Uh, and it was a very difficult uh, moment to choose among them. To me, all of them were uh, worth it to, uh, to, uh, to be on, on stage. But as you know, we had, we had to, uh, to call and, uh, and choose. But uh, as, uh, as an experience, I think it has been a great experience. Congratulations to those who uh, have been selected. And uh, I think all of you who have been shortlisted are winners in my, in my eyes. And I wish you a great uh, success in your, in, your, in your business and in your, in your companies. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. Your Excellency, Minister Al-Mullah, thank you for joining us. Your Excellency, as an industry veteran, how would you describe the caliber of the submissions that you've received this year? Thank you, Ahmed. Well, Excellency, Suhail al mazrui dear jury colleagues, distinguished guests, well, it is an honor really to be among this distinguished gathering today for this executive and expert to celebrate the 10th anniversary of the Adibek Awards. So uh, we recognize today that the eminent professionals and oil industry whose submissions not only make an outstanding difference to the industry, but also contribute to the quality of the lives of the people. So uh, having been among the Adibek Awards jury, I must say I was astonished really by the quality of submissions received it was not easy reviewing submissions and uh, by the quality uh, uh, of such seasoned inside professionals and choosing among them. So at the end, I wish to really extend my warmest congratulations to all the award winners and to convey cordial greetings and high regards to all Adibec 2020 awards contestants. So my deep appreciation really goes to all the uh, uh, supporters and uh, the Adibec Awards, which indeed helped advancing and enrich the oil and gas industry all over the years. Thank you. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. Mr. Simonelli, in your opinion, how important are awards such as Adipec in promoting innovation? Ahmed, um, very important and great to be with everybody, Excellencies, fellow jury members. And I want to compliment really on the 10th anniversary of the Adepec Awards and also the four new categories. It's vital to this industry that we continue to look for new ways of doing things and that we retain sustainability and advancements in technology. I very much enjoyed reading all these submissions, some great ideas out there, and I think truly a global view of the way in which we can take the industry forward. And as many have said already, you know, the selection process was very difficult and everybody that was nominated are really winners. So my compliments, and um, I think this is a key highlight for the industry every year, it gets better and better and the submissions that we've received the better and better. So uh, very important as we take the industry forward. Thank you very much, Mr. Simonelli. Now we're going to transition to Vicki Holub, who's connecting with us all the way from Houston, Texas. Uh, Mrs. Holub, I just got to ask real quick, what time is it over there right now? Uh, right now it's about 5.20, but I did watch the opening ceremonies of, at, of uh, Atapec, which was 4 o'clock my time. So it's a bit early. Early. <laughs> okay. So I just wanted to ask... Was there always a clear winner for you when it came to finding the finalists, or was it a bit of a process? It was definitely a process because evaluating my colleagues' hard work and the early career people's hard work, 
uh, was an exciting process. It's the first time for me to evaluate the awards, and I was delighted with the quality of the submissions. This makes it clear to me that our industry continues to demonstrate an innovative approach to problem solving and and ways to collaborate. And the collaboration really is the heart is at the heart of all solutions. So I'd like to take this opportunity to con uh, congratulate all the winners and finalists, and to thank Adipec and uh, for doing this every year and Adnoc for sponsoring this because without this, uh, our industry. I believe would not advance at the pace that it will over the next few years. And there's no other conference and no other venue where so many people are recognized and the process is so thorough to find the winners. And so uh, you all make our industry proud, those of you who are winners and uh, ad hoc, you make us proud too, to, to have this event, especially in trying times like these are today. So thank you all. And I was happy to be a part of it. Very much enjoyed it. Thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Holub, and, and once again, thank you so much for connecting with us all the way from Houston. So now I'd just like to direct my attention to Mr. Takayuki Ueda. Yeah. Mr. Ueda, thank you so much for joining us. And I thank wanted you. to ask, is, is, it, um, is there something new when it comes to finding uh, these types of awards or with the finalists? Um, what is the role of the Adepec Awards in advancing the industry? Yeah, well, thank you very much. Um, I think the Adepec Awards plays a, a very significant role to help shape and strengthen the foundations of our industry, especially now in one of the most uh, challenging times uh, we have ever faced. Uh, the opportunity uh, to enter submissions for these awards motivates and inspires companies and the divisions uh, to improve their uh, teamwork and uh, strive to make uh, a difference. This year marks the 10-year anniversary of the Advocate Awards, and once again, a remarkable group of uh, individuals, teams, and organizations have uh, uh, shared some excellent insight and uh, initiatives across a wide range of uh, subjects. Well, I'd like to once again uh, thank you, Adnok, and the organizers for uh, providing me the extraordinary opportunity to serve on the jury uh, panel. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much, Mr. Ueda. And last but certainly not least, let me introduce Dr. Pratima, who is joining us from London. Dr. Pratima, in your opinion, how can the shortlisted candidates we celebrate today drive the change in the industry? Thank you. Thank you for the question and thank you for inviting me on this prestigious uh, jury panel. You know, the topic for this year's conference is oil and gas industry's response to unparalleled change. Now, winning in times of unparalleled change is going to require both innovation and a focused drive on impact. And to your question, the shortlist candidates and, and, and definitely the winners for the Adipec Awards 2020 demonstrated these two characteristics in spades. They are innovators and they, would and they will drive forward with a focus on impact for this industry, which is much needed at these times of change. Now, um, one of the pieces of change is really around our low carbon future. And OGCI is very proud to be Adipac's decarbonization partner this year. So we are very much looking forward to seeing these winners become leaders in the future of decarbonization of our industry. From production to delivery of energy and back into all the supply chains. We need to do it together. We need to collaborate but we also need to lead. And these winners are going to do it. So congratulations to all, and thank you. Thank you once again, Dr. Pratma. And thanks again to our incredible jury for helping to make the Adepec Awards an increasingly international and exceptionally regarded award. And now the moment you've all been waiting for, the awards presentation.
The first award category is Breakthrough Research of the Year. Breakthrough Research of the Year, sponsored by PTTEP. This category recognizes projects based on breakthrough technologies with the power to become game changers for the industry. And the nominees are Inpex Corporation, R&D Initiative of Electromethanogenesis Concept Development. Towards achieving a more sustainable society, Inpex developed a new concept for electromethanogenesis in subsurface for boosting CSS, an important technology for tackling climate change. Shell. Shell Turbo Trays. The invention of the Shell Turbo Trays is a fundamental process change in contractor and distillation column design. The benefits are in applications such as LNG, blue hydrogen, natural gas sweetening, sulfur removal, CO2 capturing, and potentially two billion US dollars per annum capex savings and significant capacity increases in existing towers. NESPA, RPM, Reservoir Prescriptive Management. This is an electromagnetic technology permanently installed in the well completion. It allows mapping in real time the movements of fluids in the reservoir during production and injection. The acquisition system is supported by a software platform for data interpretation, predicting future fluids distribution, and optimizing actions for reservoir management. With us here today, please welcome on stage representatives from INPEX, Shell, and NESPA. And the winner of the Breakthrough Research of the Year is... Shell, congratulations, Mr. Vogt. Please share Thank with us you. a few words. Thank you very much. Uh, shukran. Um, it's, a, it's an honor to win uh, the ADIPEC Breakthrough Research Award. And Thank, and we thank the committee for the opportunity to showcase this innovation as well as the many excellent achievements the awards has recognized. I want to acknowledge uh, my many colleagues in Shell who have researched and developed the Turbo Trace to the fabulous product it has become. Uh, their persistence in breaking conventional boundaries and not accepting accepting traditional capacity limits has led to this spectacular outcome, empowering natural gas producers to de-bottleneck existing units and to have significant capex savings on new units. Once again, thank you very much. Uh, shukran. That's fantastic to hear and congratulations once again. Our second award category is Breakthrough Technological Project of the Year. Breakthrough Technological Project of the Year, sponsored by Mitsui & Co. This category highlights the importance that scientific research and innovation have in enabling the industry transition, which requires efficient, safe, and environmentally friendly solutions. And the nominees are Saudi Aramco and Seabed Geosolutions, Spice Rack. Spice Rack is a multi-year research collaboration project aimed at designing, developing, manufacturing, and commercializing an innovative, highly productive, fully robotized, and cost-efficient solution for seafloor seismic acquisition. Inflow Control, AICV Autonomous Inflow Control Valve. AICVs shut off unwanted gas and water zones based on fluid properties, enabling more oil production. PPTEP, Kongsberg Ferrotech and AI and Robotics Ventures, Nautilus, an innovative single robot that can deliver full pipeline services, inspection, repair, and maintenance for subsea pipelines. Subsea intervention can be performed remotely with less time, less resource, and less risk. Today on stage are representatives from Saudi Aramco, Inflow Control AS, and Kongsberg Ferrotech. And the winner of the Breakthrough Technological Project of the Year is... PTTEP, Kongsberg Ferrotech, and AI and Robotics Ventures. Congratulations, Mr. Carlson. How are you feeling? <laughs> I am surprised. I'm very happy. So. <laughs> On behalf of the team, it's our honor to be the finalist 
and also to win this ADPEC award. Well, I would like to express my sincere thanks to the ADPEC award committee for this nomination. My sincere appreciation also goes to the management and staff of PTTEP, AI and Robotic Ventures, and Comstat Heritage. Without their support, it would not have been possible for us to present the Nautilus to you and to the world. So thank you. Congratulations once again, Mr. Carlson. It's great to hear. The third award category is Digital Transformation Project of the Year. Digital Transformation Project of the Year, sponsored by National Oil Well Varco. The Digital Transformation Award recognizes organizations that adopt innovation and digitalization as part of their core transformation strategy. And the nominees are Spark Cognition and BP, improving offshore platform production with artificial intelligence. By deploying the Spark Predict analytics solution on two of BP's production facilities, BP was able to predict impending equipment failures and process vulnerabilities. This improved production up to 30 million US dollars annually per platform. Saudi Aramco Foghorn Systems, Aramco Aberdeen, the Aramco Houston Sensors Team, Kaust, and Modus Oil Field. Drilling at the Edge, a major transformational initiative where people, algorithms, data, machines, and processes existing on an oil rig at the edge are coordinated around real-time information to accelerate decision-making and optimize operations. Adnock Group and Schlumberger, Intelligent Integrated Subsurface Modeling a one-of-a-kind AI-based subsurface cognitive environment that aims to reduce cost per barrel, ramping up and sustaining production while maximizing the value of Abu Dhabi's hydrocarbon resources through transformational subsurface workflows that accelerate field development and establishes an evergreen digital twin of subsurface models. Joining us on stage are representatives from Spark Cognition, Saudi Aramco, and Adnoc Group. And the winner of the Digital Transformation Project of the Year is... Adnoc Group. Congratulations, Mrs. Moulud. How are you feeling? Thank you so much. Congratulations. Alhamdulillah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. We are honored and humbled to receive this international recognition among all these uh, distinguished uh, lineup projects. And during this prevailing scenario of the pandemic, uh, we, on behalf of IISM team, I would like to thank Adnoc Technology, Adnoc Onshore, Adnoc Upstream, and Schlumberger for supporting to achieve this outstanding success. Uh, since Dr. Sultan Al Jabir has announced the era of oil and gas 4.0. ADNOC has spared no efforts to align all the resources to make this digital transformation journey a reality. And today here, ISM team is standing here and all people who worked in the background proudly stand to celebrate this achievement, this magnificent achievement together. Today we are bringing the future to ADNOC. Thank you so much. Fantastic. Congratulations once again. Moving on, our fourth award category is the Oil and Gas Diversity and Inclusion Company of the Year. Oil and Gas Inclusion and Diversity Company of the Year. Sponsored by Total. The Oil and Gas Inclusion and Diversity Company of the Year Award recognizes a company for their contribution in promoting, delivering, and embedding inclusion and diversity into their business strategy, creating an equal, diverse, and inclusive environment for all in their organization. And the nominees are Emerson Automation Solutions, Diversity and Inclusion Programs and Initiatives. Emerson's diversity and inclusion programs and initiatives have led to a 13% increase in women in leadership positions, an increase of 17% of women in executive leadership, and a diverse organization comprised of 53 nationalities in Emerson Middle East and Africa. Baker Hughes, Driving Gender Diversity. 
Driving gender diversity at Baker Hughes helps shape the future of the energy industry in the Middle East. With a diversity profile of 43%, diversity higher rate of 21%, and a 50% female workforce in the STEM discipline across the region. Petroleum Development Oman, PDO's diversity and inclusion journey. PDO's diversity and inclusion journey has led to the implementation of modular online D&I courses, a D&I toolkit, establishment of a 50-50 gender ratio for entry-level petroleum engineers, and the extension of its maternity leave policy to 16 weeks. Joining us on stage are representatives from Emerson Automation Solutions, Baker Hughes, and Petroleum Development Amon. And the winner is... The winner of the Oil & Gas Diversity Inclusion Company of the Year is Petroleum Development Amman. Congratulations, Mrs. Rahmatullah. Congratulations. Alhamdulillah. Um, thank you very much. It's truly a proud moment for us to see that uh, the celebration truly reflects what we as a company place importance on diversity, inclusiveness as a country as well. A big thank you to all my team members and to all who have made this achievement possible. Thank you very much. Congratulations to all of you once again. The fifth award category is the Oil & Gas Startup Company of the Year. Oil & Gas Startup Company of the Year, sponsored by Ardeco for innovative startup projects poised to reshape the future of the industry. And the nominees are Angara Industries Limited, Angara Cognitive Cleaning, a high-tech company changing the paradigm of industrial equipment maintenance through the fusion of innovative chemistry and digital tools. Its clients enjoy running their heat exchangers clean and efficient all the time while yielding a cost savings of around 37 cents per barrel of refined crude. Enduralock, Enduralock Fasteners, the first mechanically locking, high vibration resistant, permanent fastener that for maintenance is reversible and reusable. It is the first mechanically locking permanent fastener for pipelines that remains locked even with cyclical thermal changes in the pipeline and the fastener. Xsense AS, new disruptive technology. A completely new way of measuring flow and flow quality from the outside of a pipe at an accuracy never seen before. Joining us on stage are representatives from Angara, Enduralock, and Xsense AS. And the winner of the Oil & Gas Startup Company of the Year is... Xsense AS. Congratulations, Mr. Husebe. How are you feeling? Thank you. This is uh, really fantastic. First, I would like to thank the awards committee and jury for this prestigious uh, award. It's a great honor and a fantastic opportunity for promotion of Accent's flow measurement business during challenging times when travel and meeting up with people is difficult. Second, I would like to thank our clever Accent's team in Norway for developing this disruptive flow measurement technology where sensors installed at the outside of any process pipe accurately measures flow rate and fluid quality. Finally, thank you for a brilliant virtual event we hope to see you all in person next year. Thank you very much. That's great and congratulations once again. Our next award category is Operational Excellence Company of the Year. Operational Excellence Company of the Year, sponsored by Samsung for excellence in operating standards process optimization, and operational resilience. And the nominees are Adnoc Group, Future Challenge and Operational Excellence. Adnoc operates one of the largest gas processing plants in the UAE. To ensure its business remains at the forefront of the global energy industry, exceeds future challenges, and becomes a leader in operational excellence, innovative initiatives were implemented successfully by Adnoc Frontliners. Shell. Shell Quest storing 5 million tons of CO2. 
The Quest Carbon Capture and Storage Facility opened in 2015, ahead of schedule and under budget. Quest has now become a benchmark for operations of a CSS facility with over 99% reliability and operating costs that are now 35% lower than originally forecast. Adnoc Group, tapping into new business frontiers. Adnoc collaboratively worked together to maximize the value of its energy resources through innovative and efficient operation by maximizing butane supply from Adnoc gas processing to Adnoc refining west by 38% with zero capex and a potential business benefit of 3.5 million US dollars per year. Joining us on stage are representatives from Adnoc Group, Shell, and Adnoc Group. And the winner of the Operational Excellence Company of the Year is... Shell. Congratulations, Mr. Veltoysen. Wow, thank you so much. Uh, thank you to the committee. It's a great honor to accept this award on behalf of Shell and the Quest CCS team. Widespread ad ad adaptation of carbon capture and storage is one of the key solutions the world needs to help solve the climate challenge. Quest continues to be a thriving example that CCS works, and it works exceptionally well. Thank you again on behalf of Shell for this great recognition. Thank you. That's wonderful, and congratulations once again. Our next award category is the Social Contribution and Local Content Project of the Year. Social Contribution and Local Content Project of the Year, sponsored by Schlumberger. Social Contribution and Local Content Initiatives have become a key priority for the industry. This award recognizes a company that empowers communities through employment, development of local skills and capacity, and by enhancing local entrepreneurship. And the nominees are Basra Gas Company, Kutwa Program. The Basra Gas Company Kutwa Program aims to build local workforce capabilities that target actual local industry requirements. In 2019, Kutwa generated more than 2.5 million US dollars in direct income for Kutwa graduates while improving production of vital gas for South Iraq. BP Oman, Khazan for SME Development, a program that aims to help local entrepreneurs make their businesses commercially viable and sustainable through evaluating their performance and suggesting methods of continual improvement in partnership with BP Oman's partner, Shiraka. The program provides an intensive, hands-on incubation experience and continual mentorship over 12 months. Petroleum Development Oman, boosting in-country value through local manufacturing. PDO has worked to boost manufacturing as part of Oman's economic diversifications. 57 manufacturing opportunities have been realized so far. PDO, along with the Ministry of Commerce, led a cross-sector ICV project where 34 manufacturing opportunities were identified in Q1 of 2020 in utilities and pharmaceutical sectors. Joining us on stage are representatives from Basra Gas Company, BP Amman, and Petroleum Development Amman. And the winner of the Social Contribution and Local Content Project of the Year is... Petroleum Development Amman. Congratulations, Mr. Eisenman. Well, uh, thank you, thank you. It's a really complete honor to accept uh, this prestigious um, ADIBAC 2020 award on behalf of everyone uh, at PDO. ICV is a core value for us and is really linked to our uh, vision and commitment to create uh, value for Amman and all our stakeholders. I'd like to thank all ICV team uh, and our contractors, suppliers, communities for their efforts in building and delivering ICV opportunities that will help uh, secure long-term uh, sustainable uh, commercial and social benefits uh, to Oman. Thank you again at the back and see you next year. Congratulations once again, Mr. Lajami. The next award category is the Solutions to Climate Change Company of the Year. Solutions to Climate Change Company of the Year, sponsored by BP. For significant progress made in reducing carbon footprints and deploying future-oriented initiatives across all sectors of the value chain. And the nominees are NESPA, 
ENI's strategy for the fight against climate change. ENI has committed to a strategic roadmap towards 2050 with long-term targets including an 80% reduction in net greenhouse gas emissions and a 55% reduction in emissions intensity. To boost sustainability across its portfolio, ENI established two new natural resources and energy evolution business groups. Neutral Fuels creating a net zero world. Dubai-based Neutral Fuels collects waste vegetable oil from local restaurants, transforms it into a net zero biofuel for private and public transportation vehicles, marine transportation, and power generators in construction. Vehicles do not require any modifications to use Neutral Fuels biofuel, and there is no change to fuel efficiency. Adnoc Group, solutions to climate change. Adnoc Gas Processing has invested in technical innovation and is committed to the deployment of techniques to achieve higher efficiency, safer and more environmentally sustainable operation. It has developed and implemented greenhouse gas emissions reduction and water management plans as part of its operation. Age of representatives from NESPA, Neutral Fuels and Adnoc Group. And the winner of the Solutions to Climate Change Company of the Year is... Neutral Fuels. Congratulations, Mr. Fielder. Tell us how you're feeling. <laughs> oh, fantastic. Thank you very much. I'd like to obviously thank the awards committee for uh, recognizing us in this way. It's certainly been an interesting journey since 10 years ago, we became the first biofuels company in the Middle East. And everybody thought we were a little bit crazy. Setting up a biofuels company in the fossil fuel company capital of the world is something that really takes a lot of vision and a lot of creativity and a fantastic amount of support from the local governments here, from our partners such as ADNOC. And we really want to say thank you to everybody that's helped us on our journey. And we've only just started. Thank you very much to everybody. That's outstanding and congrat congratulations once again. The one category that is very close to my heart is next. Young Technical Professional of the Year. Young Technical Professional of the Year, sponsored by ExxonMobil. The Young Adipec Technical Professional of the Year Award recognizes a young technical professional who has shown the ability to become a key contributor to the development of the industry. In short, one of our industry future leaders. And the nominees are Sensotech, Dr. Mohammed Akram Karimi, a technical professional who turned a research idea into a feasible product, TRL 7 grade, which is currently being tested in Saudi Aramco's oil fields. He is the founder of a multi-patented DMOR technology, which enables non-intrusive, non-radioactive, full-range, orientation-insensitive, and calibration-free multi-phase flow metering. Saudi Aramco, Mustafa al Khwaldi. Mustafa is an energetic, driven young professional with a proven track record of implementing innovative and eco-friendly solutions to various oil field related challenges in his five years presence in the industry. His leadership qualities, extracurricular activities, and interpersonal skills complement his work achievements, displaying exemplary qualities in serving his profession and community. University of Technology, Petronas. Dr. Serene Laksaumun. Dr. Serene's well-cited and award-winning invention has been commercialized to several industry players in Southeast Asia. The invention has assisted oil and gas industry players to achieve natural gas sources that are safe for public use, clean, environmentally friendly, energy efficient, and cost effective. Joining us on stage are Dr. Mohammed Akram Karimi, Mustafa Al Khwaldi, and Dr. Serene Laksao Mun. And the winner of the Young Technical Professional of the Year is... Mr. Mustafa al Khwaldi of Saudi Aramco. Congratulations. Oh, thank you. It is such an honor to uh, be the recipient of this uh, prestigious award. Uh, first and foremost, thank God for his blessings. Alhamdulillah. I'm very grateful for my mentors for setting up uh, such a great, uh, great example to follow, uh, for showing uh, faith, and for putting me in a position to succeed and thrive. I'd like to... Uh, Thanks, Saudi Aramco, uh, my management at Saudi Aramco for empowering uh, young professionals and providing all the great means of support to achieve excellence. Last but not least, I'd like to dedicate this achievement to my beloved mother. She is truly the unsung hero and to whom I owe my success. Also, would like to thank family and friends and colleagues for their uh, sweet camaraderie and encouragement. 
Thank you, Adibik, organizers, uh, sponsors, and jury committee for this uh, wonderful effort. I'm extremely delighted, uh, honored uh, to accept this award. Thank you indeed. Congratulations once again, Mustafa. The final award category is Lifetime Achievement Award for Outstanding Technical Excellence, sponsored by Impex. The winner of this award has had a profound impact on our industry. A self-confessed perfectionist, his lifelong scientific goals have centered on addressing the ever-evolving challenges of our industry in particular and our societies in general. Over 35 years in the energy industry, the winner of the Lifetime Award for Outstanding Technical Excellence has relentlessly pursued his dream of becoming not only a world-renowned scientist, but also a leader, a mentor, and contributor to and within society. His invention, Reservoir Fluid Geodynamics, known as RFG, has not only improved our understanding of reservoir production, but the ultimate accolade has become the new industry standard. Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, I give you Mr. Oliver C. Mullins. Congratulations. What an extraordinary career. Oh, my goodness. I am very grateful to receive such an important and distinguished award. I thank the organizers of the Awards Committee of Atapec for celebrating achievement in the oil industry and for the gracious recognition of me. Atapec has been so important over the many years for providing a forum for new technology and new ideas. I have always loved the oil industry, and I thank Schlumberger for giving me the opportunities to pursue my dreams. This industry presents us with formidable challenges, often framed within earth science that I enjoy so much. I have been fortunate to participate in and sometimes lead enthusiastic teams of talented people, diverse in technical skills and backgrounds that resolve these challenges. I am proud of the oil industry that is a model for all with its diverse teams working together with common purpose to achieve new heights. Thank you for this wonderful recognition. Mr. Mullins and very, very well deserved. Before closing, I'd like to welcome His Excellency Dr. Sultan Ahmed Al-Jabbar back on stage to say a few words. Thank you for joining us today. Over the past decade, these awards have provided a platform to recognize the industry's best and brightest innovators. I want to congratulate you all and thank you for continuing to think differently about more efficient and sustainable ways to drive our industry forward. Let me also express my deepest appreciation to the distinguished members of the jury for the time and effort. Ladies and gentlemen, I urge you all to continue to come up with smart, practical solutions that can improve performance, enhance efficiency, and add value. Your ideas will help drive the long-term resilience of our industry and play an important part in our collective post-COVID recovery. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency, for your warm wishes and inspiring leadership. Please join me in celebrating one last time all the winners of the 2020 Adepec Awards. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that brings today's ceremony to a close. Thank you for joining us and congratulations to all the 2020 Adepec Award winners.